This is the second part of my series about the chaparral, an underappreciated yet incredibly important and beautiful biome. If you haven't seen my first video, go watch that one because it's a much more extensive explanation of what makes the chaparral special. For this video, I've once again partnered with Rick Halsey of the California Chaparral Institute, an educational nonprofit committed to preserving the chaparral. This video highlights specific plants and animals found in the chaparral and what makes them unique, delves into the many ways chaparral ecosystems recover from fire, and explains the origins of the California Chaparral Institute. One more thing before we get into the main part of the video. I'm sorry the sound quality isn't amazing in some of the clips, but there was only so much we could do to limit the noise from all the airplanes flying overhead. Anyway, let's explore the chaparral. This is one of the characteristic shrubs of coastal or California sage scrub. This is black sage. And right now, and it's actually exhibiting one of its most incredible talents, drought resistance. All the big leaves have dropped off and the leaves that are remaining are really, really pretty thin. But the fun thing about this is it's got this incredibly aromatic minty smell. The flowers, which aren't here anymore, these are just the remains. These are little like umbrella umbels are called. And the flowers that come out are sort of purplish white. But the bees love this. If you look at the leaves, they've got little what we call glands on them. And if you look at the undersides, they're lighter colored. And they're very small. And they don't even look like they're alive. But they are indeed. And so this plant can survive six, seven months without any rainfall or water. Try that with a petunia in your yard. <laughs> it might last a couple days. So pretty tough plants. This plant is characteristic of the sage scrub environment. And you look at it and you go under, is it still even alive? It looks pretty dead and brownish and it's got some dead material here. Well, this is California sagebrush and it's got the characteristic minty smell that a lot of sage scrub species have. But again, this, this adaptation that allows it to look like this is an incredibly sophisticated talent. It just basically shuts down during the drought months so it doesn't lose any water. But a simple little sprinkle will bring this back to life in a way that is just shocking. And so some people will see this and they'll think it's dead or they'll call this a weed or something. And, and it's like, this is really the time you want to respect it because it's really showing off its most sophisticated talents. If you had to call out what's the one plant when you see it, you know you're in the chaparral, it's this guy. This is chemise. Scientific name, Adenostoma fasciculatum. Fasciculatum, fascicles, the little tiny things, that is referring to the leaves. Very, very tiny. So this is a characteristic shrub. When you find chemise, you know you're in the chaparral. This plant here, as you look at it, the casual observer would think, this is dead. It just, and it's, it needs to be removed. We need to clean this out of here. I mean, that's sort of what you think about with plants in your garden, but this is nature. And what's really wonderful about this, this is dead material, a lot of this down below here. There's still a living California sagebrush component, which is what this was down below. But on these stems, are lichens and these lichens they need old growth material that's fallen off and it has died from the original plants as a substrate for them to grow on and so you've got to have a lot of dead material in a natural system like this to provide habitat for one of the most remarkable species you find in sage scrub and chaparral and those are lichens there's a whole bunch on here if we look at these things close up there's a couple different Actually, there's three different lichens. There's this kind of light green one. There's sort of a yellowish green one. And then there's this floofy one here. Uh, and a friend of mine, uh, Carrie Knudsen, who's an incredible lichenologist, I never really noticed lichens before. He sees lichens everywhere. And he taught me how to d d distinguish between different kinds. Now I see lichens everywhere too. And so this is a very important part of the chaparral and coastal sage scrub, scrub community because they provide uh, all sorts of uh, benefits to the system itself. They, they break down dead material. They, they're pretty. <laughs> and it's just a, it's a fun member of the, of the 
chaparral and sagebrush community. There's three basic ways plants in the chaparral respond to fire. They can be facultative cedars, which is what this plant is, which means it re-sprouts after a fire. And that means it has to have a burl, an underground sort of tuber that re-sprouts after the top of the plant has been taken out by the fire. And it will be able to seed. The seeds in the soil survive fire and they will germinate after a fire. Another facultative cedar is chemise. Laurel sumac is another facultative cedar. So re-sprouts after a fire and also it can seed. The second kind of response plants can have is being an obligate cedar. So what's that mean? That means when a fire comes by, the entire plant dies. There's no underground burl or anything like that to allow the plant to recover. So the plant dies, it gets taken out by the flames, but it survives by its seeds. So this is Ceanothus varicosus. It's an obligate seeding shrub. And what happens is the seeds by the heat of the fire, there's a little pore on the seed that gets changed and that then, after the fire, allows water to get into the seed, which then stimulates the embryo inside to germinate. So this plant is especially adapted to fire in a way that it sounds like, well, it needs fire to survive or something. No, these ceanothus can last for a century or more, but over the years, they establish a seed bank of little seeds that just sit there year after year after year. They get rained on, nothing happens until there's a fire and they can be in the soil for a century or more and the fire changes the seed to allow moisture to get in and you think about that for a minute why would a seed be so stupid and not want to germinate when there's moisture well because when a fire comes by it eliminates all the competition there's a lot of nutrients on the ground and a lot of the animals aren't around anymore to decapitate the little seedlings so it's a wonderful time to germinate after a fire if they germinated now, the little mice and the bunnies would just decapitate them. They wouldn't probably have enough water and they'd be shaded. So it's not necessarily an adaptation to fires, it's an adaptation to having an environment that allows them to survive. No animals per se, a lot of sunshine, a lot of nutrients. This is our third strategy represented in front of us here for fire response. This is an obligate re-sprouter. And what that means is it only re-sprouts after a fire. There's no possibility for seeding because this is a scrub oak, it has acorns. And when there's a fire, not only does the top part of the plant get burned, but also the seeds get burned. So the only way this thing survives a fire is by re-sprouting. And so sometimes if the fire isn't that intense, just the upper portion will burn off and then the sprouts will come up here. But it has a pretty deep burrow underground too. So it will re-sprout from the ground. So this is scrub oak. All oak trees have that characteristic obligate re-sprouters. Uh, there's other plants like toyon, hollow leaf cherry in the chaparral. So it's interesting. You've got three strategies. You either re-sprout after a fire and that's all you can do, or you re-sprout and seed after a fire, or you can only seed. So those are three different strategies on how to survive a fire. And it's pretty interesting. And there's another group of flowers and plants that you really don't see normally, and they're the only ones you see after a fire. So oftentimes after chaparral fires the next year with the rains, the whole hillsides are covered with flowers. Those have been seeds since the last fire hanging out in the soil for decades until not the heat, but the chemical in the smoke or the charred wood stimulates the embryo to germinate. And so they're stimulated by the smoke or the chemical in the charred wood, not by the heat. So a lot of fascinating stories related to fire in the chaparral. Here's a beautiful little plant called Peak Rush Rose. It's got these gorgeous little yellow flowers. And this is August. So every plant has got its own little characteristic. And so there are still beautiful flowers in the dead of the drought, in basically the middle of the summer in the heat. Here's another plant that's really special. This is a this is a sunflower. I'm going to pick this. We'll take a look at this in a minute, a little closer. This is a little aster. It's in the, it's in the sunflower family, and there's three kinds of family members in the sunflower family. 
There's the, th the, 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 the thistles, which are just like thistles, and they just have those little center, what we call them disc flowers, and that's what you see the yellow ones here. Then there's the dandelions, which only have basically these ray flowers, which is what people call petals. And then there's the traditional sunflower looking flower, which has both ray and little disc flowers, which is the yellow stuff inside. So this is not actually a flower at all. This is a bouquet. It's a bouquet of ray flowers and disc flowers. And we'll take off the little ray flowers and we'll do something which everybody has probably seen, but never really thought about if you squeeze the disc flower bundle, look what happens. All the flowers come out. So every one of those yellow things is an individual flower. So this is not a flower, this is a bouquet. Right behind me demonstrates one of the most characteristic components of chaparral and scotia sage scrub. It's able to live anywhere. It's hot, I'm getting sweaty. <laughs> Those plants have been up there without any water for months. Incredible. They can go and grow in places no other plant can. The chaparral and the coastal sage scrub. In here, there's an internetwork of these dead, kind of yellowish colored strings. This is witch's hair. It's a semi-parasitic plant. It grows within the plants that you see right now. This is California sagebrush. Uh, and it, just hangs out in the canopy of the plant. It has bright orange stringy like uh, appearances when it's really up and, and running and has beautiful little white tiny flowers. So this is a parasite. It doesn't really damage the host plant because a successful parasite really doesn't want to kill its host but it's uh, it's an amazing little plant. This is shrub magic. Right here behind me is one of the rarest manzanitas in California. This is Del Mar manzanita. It grows right out of the solid sandy rock. It's got beautiful red bark. It's a true manzanita. Arctostaphylus is the genus. It's got these really characteristic oval-like leaves. The flowers, which it doesn't have right now, are um, uh, sort of like upside down bells. Really beautiful. That sound. Anna's hummingbird. Squeaky thing. If it did its whole routine, it would go. <laughs> it's the only hummingbird in California that has actually a song. But the really exciting thing about this particular spot is this plant right here. This is Mission Manzanita. It's one of the unique manzanita type species in Southern California. It's not a real manzanita because it's in a different genus, but the name of this scientific wise is Xylococcus bicolor. Look at the red bark. This is actually the living part of the shrub. Everything else is basically non-living. So the living component of this organism is right on the surface. And then as it grows, it has the little peeling bark that you often see. There's some right here. But this character's probably over 100 years old. Very rare, very old Mission Manzanita. Uh, that bird you just heard? That's a California gnat catcher. It's an endangered species. And the habitat we're in right now, sage scrub, which is related to chaparral, that's what it loves. It sounds like a little cat. <laughs> this is what's so wonderful about being in nature is you 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 hear things and when you know some of the names of the things you're hearing it's like you're at a party and you know everybody <laughs> it's a little different than when you walk into a party you don't know anyone so this is the essence of understanding and enjoying nature is it's okay to walk out and not know anything and enjoy the open air and in fact that's wonderful. It provides all sorts of physiological mental health benefits. But boy, when you know some of the names of the plants and animals that you're actually experiencing, it elevates the benefits tenfold. <laughs> it's amazing because all of a sudden you're not in a foreign space. You're in a place that, that you know it's, it's your home. Because this is where we kind of evolved, right? In nature outside for the last 10 million years. We've only been doing this 10,000 year 
civilization thing. <laughs> drop of a bucket, right? Uh, drop of a drop of water in a bucket. Um, so we're adapted to be out in nature. And so what starts happening is you start feeling like this is where you, where you belong. This is where your home is. And you are a lot more relaxed. Your heart rate goes down. Your blood pressure goes down. Your immune system improves. And how does that happen? Well, your killer T cell count, which is the main component of your immune system, that increases just by being outdoors. And it goes down when you're indoors, <laughs> when you hear fluorescent lights. And, and you're contained within square spaces. And just, if you look out here, you look at the plants, there's something different and you know it. than there is when you look at a building, there's square lines right in the building. But here, there's a lot of what we call fractals. And what those are, are constantly dividing avenues of interesting dynamic kinds of designs, multiple things. This is what you see in bonsai trees, which is why people like them so much these dividing patterns. You look at that and it's just relaxing because it feels good because you're back home. A lot of people ask me, how come you're so interested in chaparral? <laughs> I've always been interested in the underdog and, and things and people that don't uh, have a place in society or, or they're misunderstood. And so chaparral certainly fits that category. But in particular, what happened for me in 2003, the Cedar Fire burned in San Diego County. And pretty quickly, the media, the politicians, everybody blamed everybody. And the one that got targeted the most was nature. So the answer to these fires, or the big fire that happened, is we're just gonna get rid of nature. And so San Diego County had this plan to clear basically 300 square miles. Uh, so we, uh, myself and my dog, when I say we, we decided, you know, if you just provide the science to our elected officials, they'll listen and they'll say, gosh, that's really interesting. Thank you. We'll incorporate that into public policy. Well, that's not the way it works. Um, there's a lot of egos, a lot of money involved. And basically they did the exact opposite of what the science was saying, which was leave the chaparral alone. If you want to protect people and you want to protect homes from fire, work on the communities themselves, make them fire safe, do the proper defensible space, which is sort of an area between your house and the wildland where uh, you don't want the embers and the flames to be involved and then ignite your house, but leave the rest of the habitat alone. So we eventually realized the politicians weren't going to uh, listen. So I incorporated, became a nonprofit, the Chaparral Institute that I represent and we hired a lawyer and we sued the county of san diego and we stopped the project <laughs> and so i was pretty much uh persona non grata for about 10 years after that uh, a lot of people didn't talk to me anymore because i got in the way of their projects but we saved a lot of natural habitat and so we've been in that fight ever since and there's a lot of money to be made in clearing habitat people prey on other people's fears um, a lot of mythology uh, but once you realize what's really out there, you realize that's not the enemy. The problem is our own hubris, our own egos, or we think we can control nature and we can build and put whatever we want anywhere. Well, that's not the case because we don't build on earthquake faults. At least we shouldn't. <laughs> what do we do? Well, we retrofit buildings to have them withstand the earthquakes. We don't try to prevent earthquakes. Same things with fire. We shouldn't try to prevent fire because it's gonna come regardless. But what we can do is make our homes and communities more safe. So that in a nutshell is how the Chaparral Institute started. And we've moved away now from the political realm of policy and that because it's pretty frustrating sometimes to keep saying the same thing over and over um, and <laughs> spending a lot of time in court. So now what we're focusing on is education and trying to bring people out to places like this and let them enjoy the natural environment and, and see the benefits of, of doing that.